Yeah, uh, I feel a little bit like I'm jumping under the wheels of the bus just as it's leaving the station trying to follow uh, Karn and that wonderful talk. Um, because my job primarily is to simulate fake murder. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, later on. And uh, I'll show you guys some grisly fake murder clips uh, later on. Um, but it's the end of the day. I think we're all feeling a little bit punchy, a little bit tired. And I can't just come up here and talk at you. I need to talk with you a little bit first. Um, and I feel a little bit awkward because this is a very, very auspicious group of people. And uh, I'm a millennial, which is a title I really don't like. Uh, I think we prefer Willennials, uh, given Will Smith's success after he called it in his album in 1999. I mean, just his movies have just done fabulously. Okay, so I work on a show called Deadliest Warrior. Um, I'm a game designer as my day job, and that's sort of my background, what I was trained in. Um, and that brought me to the show actually through an email. But before I back up to that, let me explain what the show actually is. So Deadliest Warrior um, it is a show about taking two different warriors from history. And it can be two different types of warriors. Uh, it can be something like uh, Spartan versus a ninja. Or it can be two individuals who are known as warriors throughout history, uh, such as William Wallace and Shaka Zulu, uh, although that was our only sort of named battle, as it were, uh, in our first season. And we're coming back for a second season of 13 more episodes after doing nine to begin with. Um, so what we do is we seek out experts in different martial arts, sometimes ancient, sometimes contemporary. Um, Sometimes, formal, sometimes we'll bring in former soldiers uh, who will actually demonstrate the actual skills that they used in the case of uh, Green Beret versus Spetsnaz, which is an absolutely terrifying episode to do, but nowhere near as bad to do as IRA versus Taliban, which was just really very gut-wrenching to have to get in there. Um, and that one was also difficult because we couldn't hide behind sort of the distance of history like you can so often with ancient warriors. So we bring these guys into our lab, um, although depending on who Spike Marketing is talking to, we call it a fight club or a dojo. And it sounds super intense and super awesome. But really what it is is it's me, uh, my fellow co-hosts, Jeff Damelin, who's a biomedical engineer, former paramedic in the Black Belt. Um, he's kind of like the G.I. Joe of the show, if you think about it. Uh, and Armand Dorian, who's a practicing, actually I think he's the head of emergency medicine in a Los Angeles area hospital. Um, and so we bring these guys in, and they have an arsenal of weapons. Sometimes they're ancient weapons. Sometimes they're modern firearms. Uh, and we test those against human simulants and with an array of biomedical engineering technology, uh, things like accelerometers, so that when you actually swing a sword or a club or an ax, we get the actual reading off of what that weapon's, uh, the actual reading for how that weapon is moving. It's, it's kind of similar to what you'd see with a Nintendo Wii, except it's the bigger brother that's actually been used in actual engineering for quite some time. Um, and so over the course of about a week, we test all these different weapons. And sometimes we go out to a firing range. Sometimes we were able to keep everything in the lab. Um, and at the end of that week, we've got a big stack of physical data. And we've got a big stack of trauma evaluations, um, where we've evaluated the trauma that these weapons cause against things like a ballistics gel torso, which is uh, ballistics gel is basically a jello jiggler times eight. Uh, and it simulates the consistency of human flesh, fat, muscle, bone, ligament, uh, sub subcutaneous tissue. And we do that by uh, taking the gel and packing it with resin bones, um, organs, and in some cases, a pressurized blood system, uh, which is pretty gory when that thing gets punctured. Um, and we also use pig carcasses. So we test all of these weapons <laughs> against these different human simulants. And this is really, I'm, I'm, I have some clips to show. It's probably going to be the most graphic thing you see today. So if you are of the faint of heart, uh, maybe you want to avert your eyes. Um, we test it for about a week. And then at the end of this week, there's a big stack of numbers. And I go through that. Um, and I was brought on board to work with some custom simulation software developed by Slytherin Studios, which is a game developer over in the UK. Uh, crunch all these numbers, we run a thousand hypothetical battles, um, and we determine who the winner between these two ancient warriors is. So I like to think that our executive producer at some point just read the most dangerous game like too many times and was like, what if the main villain didn't have an island but a time machine? And that's what he was using to hunt people. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous uh, on the face of it, but it's, it's a great deal of fun. Um, it's probably the most fun job I've ever had, even though the first few days uh, I'd come home from working and I'd just sort of sit on the couch and I'd just go, I've seen so much fake murder today, which you know, seems kind of a foolish thing to say you know, in comparison to seeing a riot in Kosovo. Um, so in doing 
all of this, we're essentially trying to answer this question of which warrior is the better warrior in a one-on-one -on -one fight or in, uh, in the case of modern warriors who have automatic weapons, we have to bump that number up to five-on-five -five squad-based battles because it's too easy to just go bang, you're dead with a, with a modern firearm. Um, and I'm not really sure what that's supposed to answer, but I think it gets to something that's in the core of the male psyche. Um, our primary demographic is dudes, and I do mean dudes, 18 to 24, uh, and then in expanding concentric circles from that, uh, 18 to 34, and then 18 to 49. And if you're a woman and you've seen our show, you're either one, very cool and on the internet, or two, you live with a lot of dudes, um, <laughs> which, which is generally the case. Uh, um, but it's interesting, and it's interesting that the show is on Spike TV, which positions itself as men's television. Um, and as, as thinking about this, and as, and as I was grappling with this, um, you know, what does the show actually mean? What are we actually doing? Are we, are we illustrating virtue in the old sense of virtue from the Latin virtus, from vir, meaning man? Uh, vir has a cognate in English with, with ver, which is where we get werewolf, which is man-wolf, uh, if you think about it. So the old meaning for the word virtue was sort of manliness and machismo and all the things that a proper man was supposed to do. And I'm wondering if we're trying to illustrate that. Um, and all of this ties back to how I got this job, which was answering an email. And at the time, I was finishing up my major in game design at USC, and I was getting my minor in classics. Um, and I had actually been working for a long time on this problem of historic simulation uh, in the context of Alexander the Great, um, his life and his career. Um, and if you guys want to look up a fabulous innovator, you need to look up Alexander the Great, uh, because he did so much. Um, both in how he reformed, say, the Macedonian army and also in his political outlook and what his worldview was and how he was going to try and change the world. Um, but there are things that we don't know about his life. We know that he won a lot of battles, but we don't know exactly how. And uh, at the time, I was interested in using simulation to try and fill in those historical gaps. You know, just exactly how many men were likely to be on Alexander's side versus the side of Darius in the Battle of Galgamela. Um, where did the Battle of the Granicus River actually happen? Was it in the floodplain? Was it by the river? What's actually going on there? Um, the, there are no primary sources of his life, and so we've had to sort of piece this together uh, from conflicting accounts and try and resolve what actually happened in Alexander's campaigns and career and life uh, from all of these different records. And I think simulation could really be the key to breaking that open. Um, and so the producers of the show were sort of like, oh, okay, that's, that's kind of cool that you do that, and uh, it's kind of cool that you can talk for a long time like a nerd, but we can cut that down and it'll, it'll be all right. Um, and we're also going to need you, <laughs> we're also going to need you to act super duper excited when you see something explode, uh, which is actually pretty cool when, when you're seeing a, a grenade go up. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's how I got the gig. Um, I wanted to start as an innovator, you know, using technology to answer these grand historical questions, and I kind of wound up as an entertainer. But so far, it's been a pretty good road. Um, and I'd like to show you guys some of the tests that we do and talk about some of the facts that we learn from them, um, just because they're cool, and you can never have like too many cool tidbits. This is the first test that I wanted to show. And what this is, is we're actually testing a uh, Viking spear, and this episode is called Viking versus Samurai. And uh, this is actually a ballistics test. Uh, one of the uses for a spear, and spear is a fabulous warfare innovation if you look all the way back at the history of man. Um, you know, uh, un unprecedented on the uh, battlefield is sort of the tool that you could give to any soldier uh, and they'd be able to use it up until firearms came along. And even then, you know, uh, early guns just turned into spears with bayonets. Um, so let's take a look at this. All right, and the reason that's important right there, the 25 feet, is um, Jeff and I worked this out, and it kind of goes back to driver's ed. Uh, remember when you're told to have safe following distance behind other cars? That's because reaction time actually is a factor in many of these cases. Um, when you see something, when you see a projectile get thrown at you, you have about a half second in which you can move away, uh, and that's about how long it actually takes your brain to figure out, oh no, something's coming at me, and then tell your body, okay, get out of the way. 
so based on the speed of this weapon, about 30 miles an hour thrown single-handed, uh, within a certain range, and I can't remember the number off the top of my head, I believe it's actually about 25 feet, you literally do not have a chance to dodge or react. Um, so maintain safe following distance as you're driving your car because that'll crush you. Uh, yeah, I don't really have <laughs> a direction that I'm going with that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, it's, it, the, tidbit, the tidbit is just like, reaction time is actually a factor. Um, and, and when it comes to something like warfare, yeah, you can try and read an opponent's body language and try and get out of the way. And then you're talking about muscle memory and your training for how to dodge and things like that. But for most people, and actually in a fight between apples and oranges warriors, warriors unfamiliar with each other's style, they would actually not be familiar with the motions of their opponent. Um, something that we'll get into a little bit more with pirate versus knight. <laughs> um, because this, is, this battle was particularly interesting to do because we're talking about the gunpowder divide in history right here. Um, we were using sort of a high Middle Ages French medieval knight as our archetype here versus a golden age piracy pirate um, where at that point black powder weapons had been invented and they were useful uh, but they weren't entirely reliable. Um, but one of those weapons that actually became quite popular was the Granado, which was an early primitive grenade uh, based on filling a ceramic container or perhaps in some cases a very thin cast iron container with as much black powder, pitch, and any shrapnel you could lay your hands on. And so uh, this, is, this is one of the more graphic ones. We're actually using a pig, uh, well, three pigs. Um, and this is the effect of that weapon. Shrapnel may not be a death blow when wearing armor. There are other we have a sweet narrator. One, it causes a pressure wave. That's like a blunt trauma all over the body. Number two, it causes a loud bang. That causes disorientation and confusion. And the third thing that is probably the most deadly is the shrapnel. Shrapnel is unpredictable, flies out in every different direction, and the likelihood that it's going to get a kill is pretty high. Or not. So all of the things that the good doctor has just said are absolutely true. Um, and working with explosives, we learned a couple of cool things. Um, there's such a long pedigree of using explosives, uh, both for military and uh, civil purposes, such as construction and demolition, um, that it's actually fairly easy to just input what your high explosive is into certain software packages, um, and then come up with the factors of uh, with the factors of the explosion that would be generated. Sorry, I totally muddled that. Uh, but you can look at things like the blast wave, the, uh, the, f the velocity of the shock front coming out of that, the overall pressure it's going to create, uh, what sort of additional pressure damage or overpressure is going to happen when you do that in an enclosed area. Um, for the love of God, if you're ever in a, in a small space and something's going to explode, get out of that area. Don't hunker down in the corner because that will do you in, absolutely, 100%. The other interesting thing that we learned with shrapnel is that uh, in, a, in a large area, you actually stand a pretty good chance of avoiding it. Um, you know, grenades tend to, be, tend to work best when used against groups. Um, used against uh, one person, you actually have a pretty good chance of surviving in an open area if you get down and lie as flat as possible and just minimize the surface area of your body facing the grenade. Um, this uh, final test here that I'm going to show, it, we're actually looking at an accelerometer with a wireless rig um, connected to the arm of Matt Anderson, who is a uh, Green Beret. Um, and he currently teaches other Green Berets. Um, and what he's about to demonstrate is how an M67 entrenching tool, which is the shovel that most US Army uh, soldiers use to dig what they politely refer to as cat holes, uh, but it can also, in times of great duress, be used as an axe, impromptu for either uh, you know, clearing brush or perhaps on people. My own here, we're going to measure the swing rate of that shovel when it impacts our gel torso. So it twists to the right, twists to the left. Looks good to me. You ready, Matt? Okay. Three, two, one. So my job is to basically <laughs> <laughs> hmm. 
so my job when the doctor is in there is to actually go ahead and stick my hands into that dummy and go like, all right, well, it looks like it you know, cut through most of his viscera and it probably would have gotten the aorta. And then once you have a leak in your circulatory system, you have about 30 seconds to uh, make peace with whatever god you worship. Um, and what I actually do is I take the stuff that's coming out of that little cube that you saw rotating and then go ahead and put that into a customized software suite. Um, Oh my god, we're totally out of time already, and I totally thought this was going to be shorter. So uh, that's basically what I do, but the thought that I wanted to leave you guys with, and the grander point that I wanted to draw together out of all of this, is that what we're actually doing there is play. Um, what we do is we play with science, and I think play is a very important way for understanding the world, and for processing, and for learning. As mammals were predisposed to do it, I'd say nearly all mammals actually do conduct some form of play, and that's how mammals learn, with safety. Uh, play is sort of the real life equivalent of simulation. Um, and I'd love to talk more about this, but I've gone totally over time. Uh, and so I, if there's one thing that I urge you all to do, it's stop calling us millennials, and then second, consider adding play to your approach to whatever your business or uh, design or uh, general strategy would be. So thank you very much.